Friday afternoon, folks, uh, almost at 12.01, so therefore it is Friday afternoon, uh, actually Thursday afternoon in, in Honolulu, sorry for the confusion. Uh, uh, we just changed the time on this show from uh, 4 o'clock on Friday to 12 o'clock on Thursday for new standard time. So those who are our, our uh, trusted and faithful viewers, uh, please adjust your calendars, your watches, your clocks, and everything else, and your uh, financial statements so that you can uh, attend to us at uh, 12 o'clock on Thursday. Anyway, uh, Ted Ralston here again, the Think Tech Hawaii, uh, where the drone leads. Uh, joining me in the, in the studio here is Josh Levy. Josh, thanks for coming on again. Thanks, Ted. Josh is the coordinator of UES programs at uh, Uni uh, University of Hawaii Applied Research Lab, right? And from far across the sea, we have with us uh, Hank Lawson from uh, a lot of things, uh, Marine Corps, Teeks, Texas A&M, and uh, whatever else Hank might have uh, in his background. Hank, uh, thanks for joining us, a first timer here on the show by Skype. Good, good to be here. Good. We see you all dressed up in your appropriate, uh, uh, I mean, we can't miss the fact that you're from Texas A&M. It's right there. It's just uh, uh, screaming out at us. So, uh, Hey, Hank, thanks for coming on. You were here last week in person at the Primo Conference, and it was really great to have folks from not just the Pacific, but also that part of the Pacific called Texas uh, here at Primo, and the discussions we had and the field ex exercise out on uh, Mokalei and such, all great discussions and opportunities for discussions and developing ideas. So thanks so much for coming on the show, because what we really uh, like about what you've done in Texas, you guys have really put together a well-structured UAS FAA test range program, which is uh, well ahead of us here in Hawaii. That's where we're starting down that path, and we can learn a lot from you, and we certainly thank you and welcome uh, further learning uh, from you. And I want to thank you for also uh, helping us with the legislature last week, talking about some issues associated with uh, getting common understanding and common appreciation of what the rules are and how legislation needs to move forward to enable and authorize uh, unmanned air systems operation. So that's a whole long introduction, but uh, Hank, uh, uh, tell us a little bit about the whole laid up, lay down there between Texas A&M and Lone Star State Test Range, and how's that all hanging together? Oh, uh, pretty good, uh, Ted. I talked to you a little bit about it last week, but generally speaking, we're all part of the Texas A&M University system, and my center, the National Emergency Response and Rescue Training Center, along with the uh, Lone Star Unmanned Aircraft System Center of uh, Innovation and e Excellence. We are all a part of the engineering department under the uh, Deputy Chancellor for Engineering. The Lone Star site came into existence about three or four years ago as a uh, test range. And uh, since then, we've basically partnered. They do the all of the unmanned aircraft system stuff, everything from research to testing to working with uh, state agencies. And, and if I fail to mention it, we're part of the, uh, the Texas A&M system which is a state the uh, university system and my agency Texas A&M Engineering Extension Service is a state agency the Lone Star Center is a part of Texas A&M University Corpus Christi which is one of the 11 universities within our system so our our, our partnership from my standpoint was sort of a, a very good partnership because my center caters to first responders in the 50 states US territories we essentially train them under a cooperative agreement with the Department of Homeland Security. And we roughly train about 60 to 61,000 folks a year in the uh, the 50 states, D.C., and the U.S. territories. 61,000 people a year go through your training operation? Uh, that's absolutely correct. We do, and most of it's mobile training. We have one resident course, which we run approximately once a month. We bring 55 people in there each month. The others, the other 57 courses we have, we actually go to the location. So our folks spend a lot of time traveling from uh, state to state doing deliveries of the uh, 58 courses that we have. 58 courses, 61,000 people, and hitting most of the states, including Hawaii. You guys are out here in Hawaii training from time to time. Oh, yeah, we come to Hawaii and we go to the territories, Guam, Samoa. That's a really interesting business model. That thing is, Josh, we got a. Josh is responsible for making that happen here. Okay, that's why he's on the show. That's why we, we now have it on TV, Josh. That's what your job looks like. Now it's official, and now uh, yeah, I have okay. to you have to pick your brain. But this this structure you've got through the the, the broad ranging university, uh, through the engineering department, and then through the state agencies and such, with multiple 
streams of business, if you will, uh, not just UAS, but all of these things are kind of tied together and they somehow reflect on each other and somehow cooperate and support each other. So of those 61,000, Hank, uh, what, what proportion or percentage is UAS, the UAS training itself uh, turning into? or Where do you think that's going to go? Well, the UAS training, we really just started that. Is the, the, the training we do, we're part of a National Domestic Preparedness Consortium that was set up by uh, Congress back in 1998 after the Oklahoma City bombing. And there are seven members in the consortium to include the University of Hawaii, which does uh, natural disaster training. Some of the other members do uh, radiological and nuclear explosives, as well as uh, live agents, chemical and biological agents. So we try to cover all of the, I guess what we call the C. Bernie chemical, biological, radiological and nuclear threats that are potentially out there. The unmanned aircraft systems, we really just started getting into the game in terms of that training. And as of right now, we have one certified course out of about 173 courses that we have among the seven members. And they they do uh, the, the, the courses themselves. You probably know more about this than I do, Ted. But at the moment, the training that's done through the consortium is, uh, is done by the University of Hawaii. Our training, we're incorporating modules on UAS into the training that we do. And some of the ones that we're putting it in, we do uh, sports and special events training. So we're looking at incorporating UASs into that. And that training is potentially basically focused on uh, Division I universities, as well as all of the major sports venues, pro football, pro basketball, all of the, uh, the venues throughout the country and the, the sports themselves, NASCAR. Those, uh, those folks have a big concern about UASs. I think they saw a couple of videos where uh, out on, on YouTube where somebody hooked uh, weapons, machine guns onto a UAS and did a couple of demonstrations. And then the ideal of um, uh, explosives or other dangerous chemicals being dropped from UAS is, there, is another concern. So we're looking at that. Additionally, we do a couple of courses that involve um, incident response, bombing related courses and threat and risk assessments, and we're building the UAS piece into those. As far as numbers go, typically, I'm thinking in those arena, we're probably, if uh, the first year or so, I'm thinking we're probably gonna touch somewhere in the range of two to 3,000 folks. And as we spread it across the classes, we're essentially hoping to grow those numbers. Well, that's a really good indication because that's a proof of, uh, of the reality of the emerging aspects of UAS in all of these public safety domains. Uh, first year in training and 2,000 uh, students pushing through it. Josh? Yeah, it's pretty impressive. The expectations are increasing. Every every statement Hank makes to us is... I know. I almost wanted to get off in case <laughs> digging, digging my hole too deep here. <laughs> so we've got to uh, we got to sort of uh, learn from you, Hank. And, um, uh, and and there's enough business for all of us, I think. There's, uh, there's seven of these te uh, state test ranges, and they're all going to do something a little bit different. It would be really interesting, wouldn't it, if they could get together and, and develop these ideas in common. And uh, have you seen that occur where the seven states get together, other than at the, when the FAA uh, calls the standard uh, coordination meeting? Well, one of the things we've been trying to do, Ted, is we started this uh, National Unmanned Aircraft System Credentialing Program. And it uh, began with actually one of the oil and gas, a lot of oil and gas in Texas. And one of the oil and gas companies came to us and said, hey, you know, we're looking for people to do stuff for us, inspect uh, pipelines, uh, inspect different structures that are on their property. And they're thinking that uh, UASs are a good way to do that. And they put out these proposals looking for folks to do the work. And they get all kinds of people coming in saying, hey, we can do this work for you. And they've hired a few of them. And once they've gotten them on, they've determined that they couldn't really do what they were looking for them to do. So they, they're in Texas, they know us as a training institution, and they came to us and said, hey, could you guys put together some credentialing kind of stuff for small UAS companies? And he says, in particular, we'd like to give you a set of criteria and uh, have you certify people that we're looking to hire in basically certifying their ability to do the work that we're looking for them to do. So we put together a program that involves going through uh, testing, their their um, protocols, companies that are going to do business with this outfit. We look at their protocols, we look at their safety, we look at their paperwork, and then we bring their pilots in and do um, basically flight testing. 
and we've got some structures that involve towers and a couple other things. And we have them fly a couple maneuvers that might uh, replicate flying a pipeline or inspecting a structure. And once we've taken them through all of this, if they get through it all successfully, we sort of check it off, put them on a list of certified vendors. And the company that asked us to do this looks at that list and their plan is to hire people from that list to do the various work that they're looking for. And to get back to your original questions, collaborating with some of the other sites, what we've done with this program is we're looking at other industries. And to date, I think we've certified somewhere in the range. We're dealing with right around 50 or 52 companies that we've either certified or we're talking to about going through the process. And we've talked to some of the other sites about doing the same sort of thing. We have this process that we, uh, we refer to as uh, cooperative learning centers where we provide our curriculum to them, we provide the materials and go out, certify their instructors to do the training, certify their facilities to do it. And once we've got them certified, they can go out and actually do the uh, credentialing of, of companies either in their regions, in their areas or otherwise. That's a really great uh, summary of things you've done to drive forward. And again, Josh, uh, we got to think about this real hard. But this whole notion of, uh, of uh, uh, credentialing as the starting point, as a center point, and as a easily recognizable value. We got to think about that, Josh. I think on our end here, we do have George Purdy on the island of Lanai. I don't think you've had a chance to meet George yet. He's in our public safety uh, department here and is uh, in the educational systems as well, and has a similar concept in terms of using the hunter uh, training card that you have to get when you want to go hunting, and use some kind of a credentialing system that has an identifiable. Ident uh, mark on you that uh, could be used for drone people because what goes through my mind is our local power company here and other industries are uh, attempting to move forward and using UAVs and infrastructure management but we don't have a supply of readily trained people who are airmen and also UAS people and uh, and as a result we're having to import from California and uh, we need to grow our own here I think and um, uh, the kind of things you're doing, the credentialing program, the training program that leads up to credentialing, those would be really important things for us to take on here. That would be a tremendous value to the state of Hawaii to have that capability. And, and, and the important thing also is to have to make sure that, the, that there are people that you know, understand that there is that training certification out here, so they should be even looking for people which that Which is are the whole educational concept exactly. of this, yep. which goes back to the website. Mm -hmm. And uh, Josh, you, that's another thing you're doing, isn't it? Your expectations just keep getting out of sight here, Josh, and building, what yeah. you got to do here. Getting stressed, but, no. <laughs> you know, that's, a, that's another interesting issue. Uh, we've got, um, we've got to take our, our first break here. This thing goes by real fast, Hank, as you can see, but let's talk about the whole educational flow or the way you outpost information, the way you get people to, to call you and, and, and don't call the wrong person, how, we all, how that works in your area so we can think about that after our first break here. Hi, I'm Tim Apicello. I'm the host of Moving Hawaii Forward, a show dedicated to transportation issues and traffic issues here on Oahu. Uh, join us every other Tuesday at 12 noon and as we discuss how we try to solve our traffic headaches, not to, not to include just rail, but transit and carpooling and everything in between. So join us every other Tuesday, Moving Hawaii Forward. Thank you. You want to talk about some socially sensitive issues relevant to women? Listen to these guys. Well, I think it's important in Judaism that we don't take the Bible literally, we take it seriously. Okay. I agree, and the, really the key to understanding Christianity is compassion. If you're compassionate towards other people, you are living a Christian life, and that relates also to dealing with women and men and women issues as well. Mm. Are women and men equal? They're equal. Who's Why better? Be Who's better? <laughs> Depends tune on in, what. Tune in. We are back live, folks, here. Ted Ralston and Josh Levy in the downtown Honolulu studios of Think Tech Hawaii, uh, overlooking downtown Honolulu. And we have standing by in the great state of Texas, Hank Lawson, uh, incredible leader in the uh, Texas A&M uh, network, uh, the Texas State University's network, I might say, uh, UAS program and emergency management and disaster operations program. Hank, uh, thanks for joining us again. and. Uh, in the second half of our show here. It goes by fast, I'll tell you. F Fifteen minutes on each segment, man, and you're about, hey, did we even start yet? <laughs> we haven't got our stuff talked about. 
so, so much thanks for uh, taking your late afternoon and coming on with us. But we were talking just before the break about uh, these wonderful ideas and things you've, you've created and the things we have to create that follow along in those footsteps. How in Texas does some ambient company out in Austin, we'll say, or someplace who has an idea about getting into UAVs, how do they know to get a hold of you and, and get taken in the right direction? I mean, there's plenty of guys out there who sell them a training class and uh, plenty of guys out there who sell them a drone. How do you control that or, or manage that in a positive way so that everybody wins? Yeah, one of, one of the things that we have, sort of an advantage that we have for us is our organization, uh, Texas A&M Engineering Extension Service, we've sort of been doing this for a long time. We have a fire field, disaster city, a simulation center. We uh, also have four divisions, one that does law enforcement and security training, another one that does uh, knowledge, engineering, economic development, community support. We have the uh, Texas A&M uh, fire field, which uh, has been around over 80 years now. And we also have uh, infrastructure training and, uh, and safety, which does OSHA training. And we touch 173,000 folks a year throughout the country. So we have instructors that are always out there. So, I mean, in terms of reaching people, we have flyers when the instructors are out in the communities. They take information out on our courses. We post things on our website and on the Lone Star website, you know, under uh, unmanned aircraft systems. We also do a uh, UAS summit that, as a matter of fact, you attended uh, last year, Ted. <laughs> but we get the word out that way, and in conjunction with that, we've put together a, uh, an introductory course on unmanned aircraft systems at the prompting of some of our law enforcement and fire um, customers, actually some of, the, some of the cities within the uh, state of Texas, San Antonio, Austin, and Dallas. And uh, basically, our general outreach, we are... Uh, we have uh, Twitter feeds, we have Facebook, and uh, Snapchat, and a whole host of other things. And a number of these communities, basically, we're out there. We've been out there for a while. We talked to the responder community. And a lot of our word of mouth, as well as these uh, tools, help us get the word out. That's great. And I think that uh, I learned, uh, certainly from you last week, that you're kind of a techno geek yourself. And, uh, uh, and you're kind of in the social media thing with the cameras that take pictures automatically when it's time to update the scene of, of the state capitol, for example. And uh, uh, so uh, you are very well-tuned. Hank is a good example of a person who's well-tuned to using those social media, those means of communication. we got to think about that as well. Yep. But, you know, the concept of public safety and, and law enforcement and such, uh, one of the discussions that came up at Primo last week was with our own state, uh, University of Hawaii uh, policing organization. And the observation was that the university the campus is somewhat a microcosm of the island of Oahu or any island here. All the things that you have to think about from public safety are present. They're just concentrated in the campus and there's boundaries. And so why not think of the, the university uh, public safety organization as a beta test area where ideas and development and concepts can come together and, uh, and also in full transparency with all the issues of uh, expectation of privacy and protection of civil rights and retaining information for custody reasons and all that sort of thing. All the things that are required in the big world can be looked at in the small world and they're the same problem. So we can solve them there quickly um, and not have necessarily all the uh, protocols and such necessary external. So we're, we're thinking about that, Hank, and we welcome your thoughts on that, on that subject in terms of, again, using a campus structure as the framework for evolving some of these uh, uh, protocols and concepts. In fact, uh, let me just take to our own advertisement here a little bit. Just uh, I think if uh, Zuri can flip through these, uh, just to show you where we are, Hank. We're way down up the learning curve from where you are. This is the beginning of our uh, our, our segment of uh, unmanned air systems testing. We had we got some funding from the legislature. Got the people together. We are collecting the capabilities that exist in. Uh, lava threat, reef health management, maritime awareness, marine sciences, and power grid inspection, where we have capability today. And we think that's like the center point of our, of our uh, uh, technical capability. We have to align that with the available, uh, ideally, private lands. They're much more useful than public lands in terms of uh, getting space for uh, testing and, and training and such, which we've started. We actually have 
uh, the university itself, as well as uh, some farms, and we have the entire island of Lanai available to us. So this is kind of where we're going down that path. If we could take that framework and think of how the campus uh, uh, public safety situation uh, needs to be uh, needs to be developed and demonstrated in terms of UAS participation in it, in that physical context. Uh, that's what we one of the things we'll th be thinking about here. But your thoughts, sir, on on a campus as a place to develop these concepts. For uh, for us, again, Ted, we uh, we're with the engineering department at A and M, or in the U the uh, Texas A M University system. We have lots of folks in there, the Engineering Experimental Station, Engineering Extension Service, as well as uh, the Transportation Institute, our veterinary uh, uh, organization, and one or two others, and pretty much everyone in the system. When we started looking around as to who was doing what with, uh, with drones and unmanned aircraft systems, we sort of put a call out, and it turns out that there's all kinds of people within our organization who are doing it. So as a result of that, our risk management folks Put together a, uh, a protocol for the uh, for the system on how we we're going to handle that and how we'd get a handle on who was flying what when and where and one of the things we've done is set up a, uh, a policy that requires registration for anybody who's going to use uh, unmanned aircraft systems whether it's uh, for business purposes for research purposes or even if they're doing it for recreational purposes they have to be registered on campus or off campus so if they own them and they're planning on using them, we're asking them to register them and tell us there's a checklist of things that we ask for. But by doing this, we've uh, found that we get them to come to us and then we can tell them things that they may not know, like what the rules are. The campus is within five miles, most of the campus is within five miles of uh, our local airport, which uh, you know, basically is restricted area and a lot of people don't know that. The other side of it is we get a lot of students. We've got roughly uh, 60,000 plus students on campus, and they're easy to easy. To, the uh, drones are easy to find, easy to buy. Students are buying them and they're putting them up. We had one student that actually did a nice video, overhead video of the campus, great footage, and he put it out on YouTube to you know turn around and have uh, system administration come to him and say, hey, you know, it's illegal. You're not allowed to do that. <laughs> But, uh, but, but where I was headed with all of this is we put that in place and we're trying to get a hold on who's doing what. But we've got folks doing research. Our transportation guys are using them for, uh, for all kinds of things related to uh, road networks and accidents, forensics, uh, inspections. We have uh, our agricultural guys are using them for precision ag. We, uh, the railroads are using them, power line inspections. We, Basically, we got people doing them, using them for all sorts of things. So, uh, your idea of using a campus as a place where you can uh, explore where they can go and what kind of rules you need to corral them, I think, is, is probably a pretty good one. We'll give that a try. And in fact, you're bringing some ideas up, uh, Josh. We got to think about May. We have our annual UAS conference in May at UH, and it's a month away from next month. So it's like six weeks away, seven weeks away. We got AUVSI in the middle of that. So there's a, not much time, and I think we could take a lot of what Hank's done as the structural of how, how this works within the UA system. We're similar. We have the, the main campuses on the islands. We have the community colleges. We have a similar uh, political aid on in that regard. Uh, we don't, I don't think, have the maturity of connectivity that Hank's talking about, but we could certainly uh, think of that as a model, and, uh, and cert certainly I think we could Hank, invite Hank to come on to our conference by Skype, if not by real, and that'll be sometime in May. Uh, Hank out here, uh, uh, but uh, I like the idea that you're using the extension service. You're using, you're using the extension services and the connections that already exist. You're not making new connections. You're using the framework that exists in the university and just adding some discipline to it and some responsibility and some reporting. Just because UAVs are a more complicated system than other technical systems might be. They're not the same thing as 3D printers, for example, where there's a different level of, of care is required. And this takes me back to uh, just last week when we were out there at Mokalaia. You know where we were. We were right adjacent to the uh, departure end of 08 at uh, Dillingham Airfield. We were legally 10, in, 10 feet away, whatever the road width is, because the, the field boundary is at the road. We were on the uh, ocean side of the road. So we're talking about some work out there, and you know we could 
we could play the game of it's just plain old Class G airspace and we'll, we'll do what we have to do. But we really should probably take a higher level of care just because we are, it's Class G, but only Class G by 10 feet, for example. So this, the concept of, uh, that you're bringing up of, of thinking the thing through and having protocols and, and procedures that make and, and ensure a safe operation is, our, our first experiment will be right there at Mokalaia. And in fact, we should, I, I would like to reflect back what we're doing at Mokalaia to you, Hank, and get you to see what you would think about it. And let me give you one other thing that I didn't mention. Another thing that we're doing. We, uh, we set up a working group within the system, and we required that each department identify an individual who's going to be their UAS coordinator or point of contact. And once they identified these people, we actually sent them there, there this week. They're going through a, a, a four-day course that we put together that uh, provided them an overview on unmanned aircraft systems, what the rules are, what the regulations are. We sort of trained them up in some of the protocols, and then they're going back to their organizations. So anything and anybody in the organizations that's using drones for any purposes, if they have questions, they need to know where we are on anything, all of that, uh, they go to their coordinator. And the coordinator can bring issues to the larger working group Hopefully, they're all going to be familiar with basic rules, and they can talk to their people about what the rules are. If you're doing them recreationally, how high they can fly. If you're using them for research, you know, what kind of things you need to do. So that's that's another tool that we're using to, uh, to corral this whole process. Well, that's really great. In fact, if we had that in place ourselves, we could take our, our uh, Mokalea Dillingham operation and turn to Chapter 7, and there it would be all laid out. Yep. So we'll keep... Back and forth on this, Hank, we, uh, we managed to uh, run our time right into the ground here, and we want to thank you very much for coming on. There's so much you provided to us and so much guidance and structure that I really want to think more about and, and uh, we'll go work with you on. So, th Hank, thanks a lot again, and we'll, we'll get uh, uh, Jerry on from uh, Lone Star at a future time here and get the specifics on the actual UAS operations, but we've got together a long way to go. Thank you very much. And we'll find some way to get you involved in our conference out here in May. All right. Thank you, Ted. Appreciate it. Okay. And Josh, thanks for coming on. And uh, folks, we'll see you next uh, Thursday at noon. <laughs>